I cannot answer that question on the grounds I may be incriminated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we've never done a press conference, so this is very fun. So that's why we're, we're goofing around. I guess you guys are. Sean, would you care for a parfait? It's a tough room. Yes, I'd like a parfait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a parfait, so, dude. So since we've never done a, a press conference before, we don't, you guys are from various journalistic uh, backgrounds. backgrounds and yeah. organizations. Different I parts of the world. I know many of you have traveled from the distant lands to That's be here today. Terrible. Why am I eating this? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, can we get a candy remover in yeah, here? Candy please. Remover. Thank you. <laughs> if we could just please keep this on topic, guys. Um, <laughs> the topic would be. Uh, uh, no one's asked a question yet. Are so. we going to deploy Vegeta to the Middle East for the conflict there with ISIS? Yes. James, <laughs> Team Beat Magazine, what's your question? Yes, are you a Team Beat? <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> right. why, don't we, why don't we get started? If you guys have questions, just go ahead and raise your hands. And... Um, who inspired you to go in the voice acting? I'm going to let Chris answer that one first. <laughs> who inspired me? Uh, I stumbled into voice acting. You know, voice acting was nothing that I even knew was an option. When I was a kid, um, we didn't have the internet, so there, we were easily fooled by things. Like, I really didn't even think about the fact that, that cartoon characters had voice actors that made those sounds. To me, they were just, they just came with those voices on them. And I'm not sure everyone even does think about that. They just watch it and they accept it for what it is. Sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, well, yeah. if anything has surprised me, if anything has inspired me, yeah. it's been the fact that I was lucky enough to be offered a job as the voice director for Dragon Ball very early on. And I've gotten to work with professionals like Sean, and all the other great actors. Which, by the way, I was not when you worked with me first. <laughs> he was not. I, I great, got to work with amazing amateurs like Sean. Hey, there you um, go. <laughs> but over the years, I have gotten a chance to work with some of the most amazing people. And uh, it's weird how being, I was, I was talking to someone earlier, sometimes being a voice director and an actor can uh, be something that leads to you being very self-conscious about your own skill set. Because someone will go, hey man, just jump in there and do a British accent, and I think, yeah, I could do that, but like, I could call up Ian Sinclair, and he's sure. better at that than I am. So, sure. And as being a producer, you want to be able to offer people the best possible options for things. So, um, yeah, over the years, it's been both inspiring and made my life difficult, because I sometimes think I may not be good enough to do what I'm doing. I guess my, my answer to that was, I kind of got the voice acting, in a way, unconsciously, because I think as a little boy, if I knew there was a job for voice acting, I would have pursued that my whole life. But instead, I simply was turning down the volume on my TV and putting voices in black and white television constantly, constantly doing impressions, constantly listening to um, you know, some of my favorite uh, impersonators. And uh, I was a professional classical musician in Dallas-Fort Worth, and my friends were always like having me do impersonations at parties. They would even put me in a corner and say, do an impersonation of Popeye, do an impersonation of Grover, do an impersonation of Kermit the Frog. And I'm like, and I try to do it, and sometimes I get close, you know, but that was kind of a weird training ground. And then uh, there was an open casting call for Dragon Ball Z, and it was in the Dallas Observer. A friend of mine was like, you should audition for this. I'm like, oh, no, 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 you should. Like, oh, okay. But then when I decided to do it, I didn't just half-ass it. I was like, well, if I'm going to audition, I'm going to treat it just like a classical music audition. I want to prepare as much as I can. I put together a fake resume. I put together as much demo tape as I could. You know, I got really psychologically prepared to do it. And then I auditioned for it, and I was really excited. And then when I offered him the part as Goku, he goes, oh, really? Man, I, I thought my audition for Captain Ginyu was actually a lot stronger. I go, yeah. man, <laughs> go, man, you're going to like Goku. Yes, so exactly. Trust what he's me, saying. you're going to like this character. Yeah, that's way it. better than the character that lasts eight episodes. Yeah, I said, all right. And, you know, kind of bummed after that day. I was like, and he kept going, like, are you sure, man? Yeah, I really did. liked my audition. I'm like, dude. Be quiet, this is good. Which is so funny because that's so Goku y, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really? Are you sure about that? Like, it was so, like, stupid. And then when I went to work and realized after two weeks of recording Goku that I, I had gotten the lead part of the show, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is cool. I think the reason I felt that way is I prided myself on being able to radically change my voice. And Goku is not a huge departure from my natural voice, whereas King Kai is. And when you came into the show in the late in the late sixties, late sixties, about the year, uh, but in the late sixty episode numbers, um, 
Goku wasn't necessarily the lead in the show at the time because it was in that moment where Goku's gone and they were yeah. trying to fight off the Ginyu Force. And I didn't know. I thought so you just show up and like kick Raccoon's butt. Yeah, and it was just so that's I was and the reason I say unconsciously is because once I once I got into the, the booth, I remember thinking, "Wow, this really feels like home." So I feel like I had a dream to be a voice actor that I didn't know I had until I got in the booth, which tends to be a theme for me, like. I got to work with Frank Welker on Scooby-Doo for a Scooby-Doo thing recently, and I did not have a dream to work with Frank Welker, but I remember when I got to the session and he showed up and I realized who he was, and I started bawling in front of a co-star who I didn't know, because I just apologized to uh, Jason Spizak. I said, uh, I don't know you, uh, but I'm gonna cry now. And I didn't realize until after the session that I, I had a dream to, to be you know, with that kind of actor professionally, and, uh, uh, and then I cried after the fact. So I, I, I think I tend to, some people actually have clear, these are my dreams, this is what I'm gonna do. And mine tend to float around in the unconscious until I stumble upon them. So that's a good question, and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm guy, sorry, no more questions. Uh, no, <laughs> but can we really stick, keep it to the ISIS conflict and how Goku <laughs> Vegeta will defeat ISIS? No, go ahead, back. So kind of bouncing off that, you, know, you guys have been voice actors for many years now. Uh, partly due to the popularity of Dragon Ball Z and many other anime that you've been a part of, but you've also worked with so many great voice actors. So in that vein, if there was a Mount Rushmore of voice actors, who would you put on that Mount Rushmore? Oh, Mel Blanc, Frank Welker, who else? Unless you want to replace those two with people. <laughs> I don't know, I think my, let's see, oh man, uh, it'd be hard to narrow them down to four people. Uh, uh, Don Castellaneta, maybe, or... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, Hank Azaria. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, the guy, uh, 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 he's insane. He just got back on The Simpsons. Bree? Harry Shearer. Harry Shearer is yeah. insane. Yeah. Well, those guys, I mean, that would be a... If, if, we, if we had, like, 30 minutes to actually go through and analyze each one, it might, those numbers, those names might change, but that would be a good starting point. For uh, Billy West. Is Billy West is incredible. Yeah. Uh, trying to, what's this? Scott McNeil. <laughs> Scott McNeil is great. Yeah. Scott McNeil is amazing. Uh, Great guy, also. Um, uh, Todd Habercorn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. No. Um, <laughs> you can put his face on there because it'd be a lot smaller, and then you could fit more people on there. True. Sure. <laughs> um, yes? Like, or are you asking him something? You, yeah, it looked like you were looking at someone else to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, are you. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> as far as directing, how do you get other people to be into? I don't either. Well, first of all, I mean, Chris has directed a lot more. I was only an ADR director for three years, but I did have struggles because I was a new director, and I, after about a year of directing, I kind of figured out some things that Chris probably knew all along. I think, I think being very uh, to get people into character, I think actors tend to be generally very insecure, so making them feel really comfortable about their choices and, and trusting them is very important. Um, if they're having trouble getting into character, depends on depending on the character. I try to use a lot of imagery or anecdotes that would uh, that they would relate to. If I, because we tend to know them personally a little bit. If it's a new actor or actress, um, fun, ask them questions to see what they're not getting. Um, Chris, can you help me out? I mean, that's kind of I mean, where I go. If you cast a show well, you don't actually have True. to spend that much time getting people in the character because you have already chosen people who are very good at doing that. Um, but one thing you that can really hurt your session is if you are. As a director, if you act really passive about the uh, about what you're doing, if you don't at least try to make the job as exciting and fun as as you can, uh, that can affect the energy of your actors. So, um, and I think if you're if you enjoy directing, you kind of do this natively. But you, what I love to do is get into a scene with an actor, and you're excited to kind of yeah. make that scene great together, and you you let them do it. But you, but you kind of support them as they're doing it, giving them guidance as you go. Especially along. like if they get a take wrong, not saying that's wrong, but saying that's really great. We're over here, like keeping everything positive. Sure, you know. And I think in my in my opinion too, if an actor does something wrong, if it's not correct, it's because you haven't given. If they're a good actor, yeah, it's because you haven't given them that context. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, your character died, um, and that's why they're injured right now. So. Uh, the, yeah, to me, it's it's really about just keeping the sessions fun and inspiring and casting good people. That's it. I hope that's helpful. 
Um, I thought that we should let you pick, because I'm going to start Thank forgetting you. who I picked. And Hi, I'm from Cosplay NYC Magazine. Um, you with who magazine? Cosplay NYC Magazine. Oh, cool. Um, we're, we've been going around getting pictures of tons of the cosplayers around. How do you two feel when you see people like all the Dragon Ball Z cosplayers, the Yu Yu Hakusho's that are walking around? And have you ever thought of cosplaying? I've decided that if I just made a decision the other day, like, well, my girlfriend cosplayed as Chi Chi once uh, when we first got together, and it was not for sexual reasons. <laughs> um, yeah, it was Halloween. I just wore an orange Go Goku thing. Not um, She's reason. in the room, by the way. And, uh, and uh, so I hope I didn't embarrass her, but I just wanted to make a joke. But I just decided recently that if I were going to cosplay, I would totally cosplay as a Witcher, because I'm so into that game right now. For <laughs> sexual reasons? Yes, for sexual reasons. There's a lot of sex in that game. And it's hilarious sex, by the way. Um, but yeah, I would cosplay as a Witcher. That'd be cool. I don't know what I would cosplay as, but I can guarantee you that it would be something very comfortable. Yeah, yes, because these cosplays. The ones I've seen that are just super elaborate or hot or whatever, like, and not hot in a sexual way, <laughs> hot in a why are you wearing all latex kind of thing. Um, <coughs> and those are the ones, like, so if, of all the characters I played, I'd probably do something like Alex Louise Armstrong because I wouldn't have to wear a shirt or something like that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been funny over the years of doing this. I remember when I first started working on um, coming to these conventions in the late 90s. Everyone that was dressed up. <laughs> Good luck. Um, sorry, can Sean we have a couple minutes? This happened to me, by the way. This exact same thing happened to me. We were having dinner with the Toei Animation and Moscow Nazawa, the voice of Goku in Japan. And I put too much soy sauce uh, in my dish, almost in that manner it spilled. And the president of Toei goes, you use too much soy sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and in broken English. And I was like, oh, I'm cringing, sorry. <laughs> but Moscow did compliment my ability to use chopsticks efficiently. So I was very, I'm very good with chopsticks. She goes, you use good chopsticks. Yeah, she told me I was amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so she might have been lying. Um, actually, what were you there was a moment during that dinner, actually, when like, literally a single drop of soy sauce was dropped on Moscow Nozawa's shoulder during the dinner. And I'm not sure how public knowledge this is supposed to be, but it, it's, it's okay. It wasn't anything offensive, but like, the waitress came by, and this is probably one of the most important people in all of Japan, came by and like, tipped a, got bumped and tipped the tray, and a little bit of soy sauce got on her very complicated colored shirt. And uh, you would... You would have thought that they were going to have to shut that restaurant. Yeah, it's four or five. It's like, oh, yeah, so sorry. It's like people were waiting in line with rags, going, "Oh, yeah." The whole crew they were very so upset so that they had. Uh, it was it was a, a it was scary adorable. moment. Scary and adorable, but yeah. We, but I somebody was shot. I wasn't trying to be, but it started. It, the screen changed, and I was wondering uh, if whatever recording device you were using. Oh, maybe the power shut off. I was afraid that whoever's recording with this, it had stopped, but I think it was just because your charger was done, and I just wanted to, I'm not trying to mess with your phone. You got a text from your mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> home. Uh, <laughs> but so, yeah, uh, what, when I was first doing this, uh, cosplayers were fascinating to me and really, really weird. Like, yeah. it was very strange to me, but now... And there weren't a lot of Gilkus or Vegetas at the time. Not as many, uh, but now I, I recognize so many of them, and on top of that, I don't even notice them hardly anymore, because they're all become so good and we've become so used to them, that it's not even unusual to yeah. anymore. Like when people aren't in cosplay, it's more unusual. <laughs> it's true. I kind of feel the same way. Um, we see lots of Goku's now, and they're getting better and better and better. And a lot of guys are like not just like, oh, I'm nervous as Goku, but like I'm totally out of shape. Oh, I've been working out for six years, to yeah. and they're like huge, and they look like Goku. Yeah, and they, they did like, just because they got their contacts in and everything. Uh, yeah, it's impressive. They go all the way. I think it's the woman earlier today was using her cleavage as pectoral muscle from the Super Saiyan <laughs> 4 Goku. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of disconcerting. I'll tell you, as, as a somewhat overweight uh, voice actor, uh, it's always strange to me when um, people come up to me and go, man, Dragon Ball Z inspired me to be a level 8 black belt in karate. Yeah. I'm like, man, it hardly inspired me to go to work, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got inspired a few years ago to start karate, and I studied for a couple of years, and I only quit because I moved to LA and hadn't found a proper teacher yet. For but, sexual reasons. For sexual reasons. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I had the weird experience of being in class, and, and my kiyas, you know, when you have, you have to say kiyas, Chotokan karate, sounds so much like Goku because I can't help it. And there are a lot of fans in the class, and I remember doing a move and going, Kya! and then the person next to me is going, <laughs> <laughs> like they're so geeking out, and I'm like, I'm trying to work out of here. So that was a fun experience. Uh, it's flattering, you know. Um, yes. Me? Oh. <laughs> we 
we allowed to talk about revival of reason? Oh yeah, we are, we're here to talk about that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, uh, ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, were you guys even sure that you were even going to be able to dub that movie on such short notice? And what was the best thing about working on it? Well, the first part's a Chris question because he's the producer and director of it. Well, we were just, I, I didn't think we had such a short notice. I was hoping that we wouldn't have to wait a year before we dubbed it, like the first time. Because uh, we, it, with Battle of Gods, we had to wait almost a full year before we could even start dubbing that show. It was driving us all insane. We weren't even sure what was going on with it. So when the next Well, what was driving us insane is everyone asking us if they were going to dub it. That is true. Every day, all day. But with... Uh, <laughs> Which is sweet. The, uh, the you know Resurrection F, we got those materials very early. As soon as they were finished working on the movie, I think we got an early animatic of it before they even had finished it in Japan. So we had a chance to review the materials. We knew what sort of people were going to be in the film, what sort of people needed to be cast. But the coolest thing about Dragon Ball Z is that bringing these guys in to do it, it's not like we have to sit around and discuss what the characters are. That's about. cool. You just bring everybody in. They already know what they're doing. It's like hiring the A-team to come in and just didn't get it all done for you. Uh, Chris Friggin is a fellow when a plan comes together. <laughs> and, he and they do smoke cigars a lot. And they do have to drug me to get a place. I'm not gonna bleed! You know, <laughs> like, I'm mean, gonna be drugged. No, I mean, they get me to, there. like, get, you mentioned that before. You said getting shot to Texas is like true. tea. And it's not because I don't like to fly, just for some reason, every time I have to do a session in Texas, I get sick in some way. I think it's because I just don't like Texas anymore or something. I don't know. I'm just actually Texas. trying to think of how out of context that sounded to all these people who never seen the A-team. the A-team, just like, me doing an impression of your team sounds like, totally racist now. <laughs> yeah. So that's how he talks. I beat a fool. You know, I worked on my, when I was a kid, I was working on my Mr. T impression all the time, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so for Resurrection F and for Dragon Ball Z before that, uh, Mr. Sabat, you've been on both sides of the microphone as an actor and as a director. So how do you manage those very distinct positions and like who directs the director in those situations? Uh oh, step up? I'm, I'm the worst director to myself because I make myself do a lot of takes because I get very paranoid. The only thing that really helps me out is that I have an engineer, his name is Raleigh, um, Raleigh Pickens, and he has been the main engineer at Funimation, sorry, at uh, Ocratron, my studio in Dallas, for a long time, since I started the studio. And he has seen so many of the episodes, and he, he's been sitting there while I've done so much Vegeta and Piccolo and Yamcha, that he's a really good gauge for me to go, dude, was that okay? Um, they'll go, yeah, it was fine, man. Or sometimes I'll be doing it again and again and again. I go, Chris, dude, it was, it was like fine eight takes ago. You don't need to do this. So, uh, yeah, I'm very harsh on myself, and probably more so than I am on any of the other people. Yeah. Oh, and as for me, I never, I had a rule when I was ADR directing that I would not cast myself on parts for that reason. However, every once in a while, I would just have extra ancillary parts that I just could not get cast, and I'd be up at the studio at 3 in the morning. And this is in the early days, we were, we were using QuickTime. I'd have a keyboard, one of the first wireless keyboards, and I'd turn the monitor on into the booth, and I'd sit there and record myself uh, for whatever part I had to fill in or whatever part I was going to do, you know, until I was done. And I didn't have a director, and I was just like, okay. And sometimes Michael would come in. I worked at Michael Center Nicholas's studio, um, and he would, you know, check things. But in general, he was off doing his thing, and so you know, it was just a crapshoot, and I just hope I got it right. Um, I'm pretty, you know, I'm part of myself as well, but usually out of the booth. Once I'm in the booth and I make a take and I'm clear on it, I'm, unless there's, I did pick a little bit, but, you know, there was only like two lines at the end of recording Battle of Gods I wanted to fix. And Raleigh and I uh, went through and checked everything. There was one or two lines, and I'm glad we did because one was just clearly inflected wrong, and we fixed it. And so there's not a single thing I think I did in Battle of Gods that I'm unhappy with. I, I consider my best work personally as Goku. Um, I'm very thrilled with it. And, and Resurrection F, I don't know if it's better, but it's definitely equal uh, in terms of my part in it, I think. And, uh, I, and, and Resurrection F is just <coughs> just a mind-blowing movie in terms of quality, because they just keep upping the ante. So I think fans are really going to love that movie. And when you watch them together, you see how they kind of fit really well. But it's really a, a double feature. Like if you, if they had double, I wish they would do that. In fact, that'd be cool if years from now you were like, you know, Battle of Gods, Resurrection, F Afternoon Double Feature or some kind of thing. That'd be do cool. it. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good film to watch back to back. <clears throat> yeah. 